And if you notice that no, nobody else can do, nobody does it better, says Carly Simon. Nobody drives me psychotic better than you do, sweetheart. That there's a phrase or a look, it can be so, like, you know, subtle, like, there you go again. And you just want to claw their eyes out. I mean, except you're a Christian, so you don't feel that way. But um, I feel that way a lot sometimes. The fact is that, that they can, like, um, they can get to your heart and make you feel unloved or make you feel um, frustrated or make you feel bad or whatever. Why is that? Because that's the nature of love. If you're going to love somebody, that's how it's going to be. A lot of people who have a button pusher relationship just will always will come up to me and say, I just want somebody that I'll never have to have that kind of like risk and vulnerability with. And I'll say, then, you know, become a hermit. Because the nature of love is that you're going to have to be open. That's the way it is. You just want to make sure that you're open to the right kind of person. But that risk and that kind of like my guts are hanging out thing, that's not a bad thing. God built that inside you. So the first one is they can get to you and let them... And, and let that be a good thing. You, you, we'll, we'll talk later about protecting yourself because you know you should never be injured and really harmed. But the fact that you can be gotten to, if I can say it that way, means you're alive. It means you have feelings. It means you're listening to like life and light and, and God lives inside you because that's the nature of love. Here's the next part. Is that often, um, because you're involved, you cannot be separate and objective in the situation. You know, a lot of times, for example, if you're with someone who's um, like really controlling and dominates either, you know, by threats or the loud voice or whatever, and you've learned to live around, you've learned to walk on eggshells and you've learned to be sweet and nice and how to read their moods and all this. To solve the problem and address it the right way, it's going to be hard for you to pull away because you're so used to feeling their feelings that you can't feel your own feelings anymore. See, you've got the radar out and you're trying to figure out a step ahead. Uh, how do I cut it? They're getting ready to build up. Okay, you know, the, um, I can tell the voice just got loud. The, the pulse just got quick or they just pulled away. I can tell there's a volcano coming. And when that happens... You've lost yourself because you can't feel what you feel anymore. You can't feel, am I happy? Am I sad? Do I feel in love? Do I feel scared? You don't know what you feel. You're too busy kind of being vigilant and making sure another catastrophe doesn't happen. So it's very difficult when you're involved to be in touch with yourself, in touch with your heart, in touch with your soul, all those things, because you're basically living kind of a, uh, an out there paranoid existence. Let me make sure I've covered everything. And so... Kind of, you shut down. And then the other part is that there's a lot of times what we call a huge power shifts in the relationship. Power shifts. And let me explain what a power shift is. When, when you're in a good relationship, everybody's got power over themselves. That's what you've got. I've got my choices and I've got my schedule and, you know, I've got my opinions and all that. And you've got yours and I want to be with you, so I'll tell you what, you limit some of your freedoms to have choices, and I'll limit some of mine, and that's what we'll call a relationship. A relationship is not where two people decide to be totally free and do whatever they want all the time because then something's going to clash. A relationship is when you freely say, I am going to like curb some of the things I'd like to do to be with you because you're worth it, and I'd like for you to too. Then people really get along. That's why friendships and marriages and things like that and, and partnerships go really well. In a, in a button pusher relationship, most of the time is spent either managing that person or reacting to that person. The power is in the hands of the pusher, the button pusher. I'll give you an example. You, you're talking to a friend. And it's somebody you know, and you're having your, you know, lunch with that person. And you say, how's it going? Well, things are going well. Why? Well, because Bill's nice to me. So you're defining your good life by Bill being nice to you. Then you have a lunch the next week. How are you doing? Not really good. Why not? Bill's not being nice. So a good week is when Bill's nice. 
A bad week is when Bill's not being nice, whatever he's being, you know, selfish or disconnected or mean or whatever. Who's in charge of that relationship? Bill. That's why people want to kill Bill. <laughs> so, all of a sudden, the shift is from me having choices and then giving certain choices up to develop love between us to how do I live on this roller coaster called Bill and he is defining, or she, or you know, whoever the person is, is defining my life and my happiness. That's a power shift. I'm not saying your button pusher doesn't affect you. Your button pusher certainly does affect you and should and influences you and matters to you and all that. But when you start noticing that you're not making free choices anymore because they're the right thing to do and you feel strongly about them and you're doing them fully and wholeheartedly, if you're doing them because you're afraid or you want to manage the person, you want to make sure that things aren't upset, you're kind of in trouble because you're in prison. And prison's not a good place to be. Prisons where people go who can't, can't feel ready for adult life. And you, there's a, if you're in prison right now tonight, there are ways to get out of it because you need to not certainly not be controlling your button pusher, but your button pusher should not have that kind of power over you. They should have influence over you, but not power. Okay? So let's talk then about your button pusher in your own life. In other words, remember we mentioned that they can affect us? Let me tell you some of the... Uh, signs and symptoms of life with a button pusher. And remember, it's, it can be somebody who's like very mild, just kind of like a difficult time person to get along with, to somebody that's really severe, like an out of control alcoholic or somebody that's violent. I mean, there's, there's a, a real spectrum here. But there are several um, key uh, experiences that those who love and want to be with a button pusher go through. The first one is alienation. Alienation. Alienation is when we feel like we are not part of that person. We feel disconnected. We feel apart. We feel like we can't reach them and they can't reach us. That's one of the most difficult experiences a person can ever have because we were designed to be, feel warm and close and valued and empathized with and understood and all those things. And a lot of people who have attempted to reach their button pusher can't do that. They'll kind of come away feeling like, like, you know, here I am. I'm in this relationship, but I'm not in this relationship. This is like, there's a disconnect here for me. I, I look like I'm connected, but I'm not. They're here in body, but we really have, don't have a relationship. You know, we can talk about circumstances and that kind of thing, but I'm all alone here. And there's this profound, profound sense of being alone that the person experiences. That's very painful to them. That's what alienation is. And it's painful because it's not a good thing. To be alone, especially when you're in a relationship, is one of the most painful things we can experience. And it's one of the most devastating. Because all of your, all of your, uh, your, your, your neuro wiring and your senses and your emotions are kind of saying, the person's here, go get going, connect, you know, get close. Everything's firing in you. And nothing's really happening. And so there's this tremendous, tremendous feeling of loss and uh, I'm, I'm all by myself and, and all this. Which is, if you've ever been through a divorce, if people will say that, like, you know, their divorce is hard, but what was really hard was living in the same house with somebody, two bodies and no souls together. That was really harder for them. Um, a second thing is a sense of helplessness. Helplessness. See, good relationships should be built around a sense that I've got, I, I can matter, I can make choices, I can do things. And when you're around a button pusher and you come to them and you say, you know, there's a problem with, I don't know, uh, that you're critical and it hurts my feelings and I want to get over with that. Now, now you're not helpless. You're kind of like, okay, I didn't know I was doing that and we fix it. But with a button pusher, when they react or blame or it never happened or yes, it did happen, or, no, it didn't happen, but I'll never do it again, even if it did happen. Hypothetically, I won't do it again, but it really didn't. I mean, because sometimes the button pushers kind of like, they're very inconsistent. I mean, reality and truth have a very small part to play here. They're not looking for truth here. They're trying to get out, out of responsibility. The person feels totally helpless, like, I, I don't have any choices here. No matter what I do, I can't make you see how I feel. I can't tell you I'm in trouble. I can't tell you this is what I like. 
I can't tell you, if you would change this, it would make a big, you know, a huge difference to me. It reminds me a lot of kind of the, um, the self-assumed helplessness that, that God has. You know, I've been reading about um, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem before his death. And there's a really interesting passage that says when he was on the way there and looking at the city of Jerusalem before he entered it, it says he started crying, burst into tears. And talks about how he wished Jerusalem would have responded to him. That's Now, he didn't have to feel that way. He, he had a lot more power than he was taking then, but he deliberately took that power away from himself and felt the helplessness of, I can't reach you. And that's a very, very common experience people have when they're with a button pusher. Nothing I can do can reach you. And then here's the next one. Not only do people feel alone and they feel they don't have choices, they also feel like they're bad. That they're a failure. There's something wrong with them. And the reason for that is every good relationship should, is designed that we should be each other's dumpster dumpster. Everybody know what a dempster dumpster is? Dempsey dumpster? I thought it was dempster. Dempsey. Learn something every day. You should be everybody's garbage container. And a relationship, I think, is kind of a filtering system for garbage. So you come home and you've had a crummy day and the person goes, Oh, that was awful. God, what a jerk he was. And man, can you believe that? And you go, Yeah, that was really bad. Let me tell you some more. And you kind of like get it all out and you feel better. You feel, okay, I can live with this. And you help to detoxify me. You heard what I had and you, you dimpsied my stuff. And then the other person does that too. And they talk about, you know, you know somebody was mean to them or they had a, a project they couldn't get on time or there was a frustration there or they didn't have enough resources for their job. And you just sort of <clears throat> open up to each other and, and all of a sudden things are okay. And, and when you've got problems with each other, you should be able to be each other's container for that and say, look, I just want to get it out of the way that you're some, you know, I wish you would like, you know, pick up your socks. Because, you know, gals, we wish you would do that more. <laughs> we're tired of picking up after you. It's just hard for us. Well, we're all neatniks, and that's a total fantasy right there. But point being... And then the other person just goes, okay, yeah, sorry about that. Tell me when I do it. You know, let me know. I'll put $5 into the kitty and we'll go buy, I'll buy you dinner or whoever's got the most money in the kitty or whatever. People have a million systems for that. But in the case of the button pusher, the toxins stay there. And not only that, when you mention a problem, they throw their toxins on you. And instead of having two containers, there's only one and it's you. And so you end up feeling like it's all your fault. Every problem you're bringing to the table is you. And a lot of times, the person that loves a button pusher and cares about a button pusher is by nature anyway kind of a sponge for the bad things. You know, Susie or Sam codependent. Why do you think codependents get, fall in love with button pushers? Because the button pusher is looking for somewhere to put that junk and the, and the Susie codependent is saying, I'll take it. I like that stuff. I can deal with it. <laughs> Is that what love's about? Yeah. <coughs> and she kind of gets full, but she doesn't know what to do with it, or he doesn't know what to do with it. So you kind of bring your own issues to the table there, too. But they end up feeling like a bad person, and like something's really wrong with me, and I'm the source of all the problems, and that's nowhere good a place to be. So your involvement in life and in your own life, that's how they affect you. Because most people that I have button, button pushers in their life, whether it's something serious or not serious, and I talk to them about it, most of them have made attempts to do something. You know, they've tried to have the talk. They just didn't know what talk to have. Or they tried to change things. Let, let me explain a little bit about why we have the wrong attitude. When, when you know, start noticing that you're feeling alone, or that you're feeling helpless, or that you're feeling bad, Many times, it's not because the button pusher is unreachable. It's because you were never told how to deal with it. You were never given the skills and the tools and the information on how to deal with it. You, I was talking to a, somebody, a, a friend of mine in business that's never, you know, he's kind of one of these, 
He just doesn't live in the dysfunctional world very much, if you can believe that. He's, you know, he's kind of young. He's never been around people that were weird. And everybody in his life is highly structured and very loving. And he, kind of, he finally got around what I would consider a normal, crazy person. First time in his life. And, you know, he, he keeps saying it's, it's the person that works under him. And he keeps saying, you know, you need to get the project done. Well, this person's a total flake and is irresponsible and blames everybody else. And he's never had a person like this in his organization. He goes, I, you know, I told you last week to get the project in. Can you get it done? Yeah, I'll get it done. <laughs> and next week comes by and he doesn't know what to do. And he doesn't know how to deal with the person. He comes to me and says, this guy thinks the wrong thoughts. What do I do? And I, and I, and I said, I got to laugh first. I, I'm on your side, but I got to laugh. Because you finally got somebody who's not governed by reason and ration. And I feel like, welcome to the adult world. He's going to see a lot more of these in his career. I'm glad he's got one now when he's, you know, 27. He's, he's starting to figure out these, these skills. But point being is that we don't know what we're doing. We don't have the, the skills and tools. And that's why most people I know who have a button pusher... They do one of two, um, two reactions that don't work for them. The first reaction is that they do everything they can to change or fix this person. And they'll, I mean, they do a lot of things. They'll ask them to change or they'll nag them. Or, you know, we don't, if you're in the church, you don't nag, you encourage. We <laughs> never nag anybody, but we encourage many times a day. And that doesn't work, and so you, you know, you get mad, and then you, you know, you're sweet, and then you're not sweet, or you, and then you try to find a way to manipulate it. But you, you kind of go through your whole song and dance, and that doesn't work. Then the other side is the person that goes, I'll just resign myself. I'm in this thing. I'll just make the best of it. It's not going to change. She's not going to change. He's not going to change. And I'll, I'll try to be happy in other ways. And neither one of those really work for you. See, the first one, you're trying to control somebody you can never control, which we don't have the right or the power to do. And the second one, basically, we give up too quickly because we either don't know what we're doing, we never were told what to do, or we don't want to enter into the conflict or we're dependent on that person. And my, my thesis about all this, about button pushers, is I think we give up on them too quickly. I have really seen over a million years of counseling we tend to just write them off too quickly and go look for somebody else. And not to say there aren't people that should be left, shouldn't be left, because there, there are. But the problem is, on the other side, I have seen lots of button pushers change and grow and get it. And the lights come on and feel sorry and say, what can I do to make things better? I don't like this because it's like the lady... Um, who was answering the question earlier tonight. She said, I see what they're doing to themselves. And they see what they're doing to themselves. And I always want you to remember, when you're thinking about your button pusher, think about the prodigal son. And at some level, you and I are the prodigal son. And at some level, your button pusher is, in Luke chapter 15. But he had to be eaten with the pigs, right? He had to be at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom. And then he decided... I'll go back and tell my dad, just put me with the servants. You know, he didn't go back and say, you know, I'm still the son. I need to get, you know, half, half of everything. He went back. He, he said, I'm going to go back and say, just treat me at the bottom because that's better than where I am now. And I have seen that happen time and time again to people who have had a button pusher in their life and they know what their resources are. In the, in the next few talks, I'm going to talk about the seven resources that you have, that you may not have any experience or knowledge of, but you, but you will, that you can do because you can make a profound and big and significant difference in your button pusher. I've seen people who we have written off and just said they're hopeless, but God didn't write them off and God didn't make them hopeless. And here's the point. You may be the angel that God sent to that person not at all devaluing their effect on you, but you may be one of the people he sent to love that person and be with them and say, you might not like what I'm going to say to you, but you need to hear this, and I need to tell you this. And if your goal in life is for your button pusher 
to rise up and call you blessed? That's the wrong goal. If your goal in life is for your button pusher to have the lights come on and to see how they affect people and to go a different way because it's not good for them and it's not good for you and it's not good for anybody because it's not the path of light and relationship and love and attachment and ownership and responsibility. If they start to see this is the path of destruction, you have formed, been part of a miracle here on planet Earth. So I guess what I'm saying is just because they've been that way a million years, maybe nobody knew the right things to do for those million years. I'm not ever saying try the same old ineffective things a million times because that's the, you know, as Alcoholics Anonymous talks about, that's the definition of insanity, trying the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. But I am saying there are things that you might not have thought of concepts, principles, things to say, things to do, it can make a huge difference. And I've seen the button pushers that have come in and out of my life change because somebody stuck with them long enough. So be patient. I've seen really good things happen, and there can be hope. We, um, we appreciate how much you guys work on relationships. I know a lot of you guys have gotten relationships that have been tough for you, or relationships that are over now that were tough, and I want to make sure that you know that, um, that the reason that Henry and I do these talks about relationships is because relationships are very important to God. And that ultimately the solution to a relationship problem or a button pushing problem or whatever you call it is a spiritual solution. That's why these principles come from the Bible. And we want to make sure you know that the most important relationship you can have and kind of like where everything comes from, in fact where the Bible comes from, is from Jesus. And that the one way to be connected to God, to be on his team and in his family, is through his son and his son's death. And just to know that the very, very simple realities that everybody needs to know to make a decision about whether they want to be a Christian or not and be connected to God is that we all sinned and fell short. Jesus died for those sins. And we need to ask Jesus in our heart. That is all a Christian is. All a Christian will ever be. It is that simple. It's not about being good or going to church a lot or being religious or knowing a lot of things. It's knowing you've screwed up, knowing that Jesus died for that, and knowing you've got to accept him as Savior. And if you haven't made that choice or that decision or not known about it, I'm going to close with a, close with a prayer now and give you an opportunity to silently pray along um, because a lot of times kind of the lights come on for people when they've had a difficult relationship, it's like that's the time that they realized, i got to reach out to God. Things aren't going right. My life, the way I knew it, isn't working. My willpower isn't fixing things. Being a nice person isn't big fixing, fixing things. And that's where God wants us sometimes. And if that's the truth, then God bless you. You might be here tonight in the right place, in the right time to meet him and let him love you and solve that problem for you. So I'm going to close in prayer and um, pray along with me. God, we, um, we ask that um, you will show us where we're pushing buttons because you're into redemption and you're into changing and you're into hope. And we ask for the person in our life that we will be, will be a person who is, brings light and light and truth to them. And Father, for anybody that doesn't know for sure what their standing is with you, I just ask that they will say, God, I know that I've missed the mark and I'm, I've sinned. And I know that I do that. I also know that Jesus died to pay for those. I can't be good enough to pay for those. Only he could die for those. And I personally ask him into my heart as my Lord and my Savior to forgive my sins, knowing that if I ask Jesus in my heart, everything changes. I have a new way. I have a new relationship. I have hope because I'm now connected to you where all good things and all good solutions come from. Bless us this week in Jesus' name. Good night.